Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Huntington Library, Art Museum and Botanical Gardens in San Marino, California. You are in the right place if you are looking for looking like a person portraits after coloniality. It's great to see so many of you streaming into our virtual auditorium. We very much regret that this symposium is not uh, taking place in person on site at the Huntington, especially on a day that's as significant for the Huntington's art collections as today is, as you'll be aware, uh, Kahindi Wiley's uh, portrait of a young uh, man uh, is being exhibited for the first time in the Huntington Art Gallery in the Thornton Portrait Gallery, looking right at Gainsborough's uh, Blue Boy. It's just been installed and opened this morning, and I'm sure Melinda McCurdy will say something about that in a moment. Uh, this being a virtual conference, we have, of course, abbreviated the sessions and compressed the papers so that nobody suffers from Zoom fatigue. But I would like to thank all of you for joining us uh, uh, this uh, Saturday morning. So without further ado, I would like to thank on your behalf all of those who've agreed to speak uh, today, the stellar lineup of speakers, but especially to thank Malik Gaines, who has been the driving force behind this uh, programme over the 12 months that it's been in uh, development. And I'll very briefly introduce Malik in a moment. He has been working with Melinda McCurdy, who is the Curator of British Art at the Huntington, Melinda holds her PhD from UC Santa Barbara and has curated many, many exhibitions here, including a forthcoming one next year on 100 Great British Drawings, which is accompanied by a really rather wonderful uh, catalogue. Malik Gaines is Associate Professor at the Tisch School uh, of the Arts in New York University. He holds his PhD from UCLA. He's author of Black Performance on the Outskirts of the Left, which appeared in 2017. And as a writer and performer, his work uses musical, theatrical and critical techniques to playfully act out social difficulties. His articles have appeared in Women and Performance, Art Journal and in magazines, including Art Forum. Among his most recent pieces is an interrogation of the Huntington's own art collection, a really rather provocative piece of writing. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree when you get the chance to read it. And that art collection is under the spotlight today for reasons that I don't need to explain any further. Malik, over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I really wanted to thank you, Steve Hendel, the Director of Research for shepherding this project and helping us transition back to the virtual <laughs> domain. Um, I wanna, of course, acknowledge that the Huntington sits on the land of the Tongva people who historically inhabited the San Gabriel Valley and I wanna thank Melinda McCurdy, especially the wonderful, <laughs> incredible curator of British art at the Huntington who's worked clo closely with me over months. And I also wanna thank the director, Christina Nielsen, um, who helped instigate this project and everyone at the Huntington who's worked with me in various parts of this project over the last months. And especially all of the panelists and moderators from far afield who are joining us today to talk about looking like a person. Um, I was asked by the Huntington to contribute to their forthcoming book about the new Kende Wiley painting, which was unveiled just this morning. And this led me to research for a proposed collection show instigated by some of the issues raised in Wiley's intervention. And it also led to this symposium. And one starting point for this inquiry is the ways Wiley and other contemporary artists have used blackness as a kind of revitalizing material. Um, the scholar Zakia Jackson, who is joining us today, has identified in her book, Becoming Human, an enlightenment intellectual inheritance that rather than simply denying humanity to black people, offers uh, blackness as a materialized plasticity and I'm quoting from Jackson here, plasticity is a mode of transmogrification whereby the fleshy being of blackness is experimented with as if it were infinitely malleable lexical and biological matter such that blackness is produced as sub slash super slash human at once, a form where form shall not hold potentially everything and nothing. <laughs> 
So with some of that contradiction in mind, today we've assembled scholars from the disciplines of art history, literary studies, curatorial studies, and performance studies to think about what it may mean to look like a person in art. Uh, to set the stage, I thought I'd share just a couple of paragraphs from my uh, contribution to the book, um, which I titled uh, Overrepresented, in which L.A. Blue Boy visits San Marino, a city named after a plantation named after Europe's oldest sovereign state situated on a Tongva village. And by introduction, I say artist Kehinde Wiley is well known for his large colorful paintings that insert black subjects into canonical European settings and ornate decorative patterns. His body of work is full of beautiful young men and sometimes women posing heroically in finery and regalia. His work is fine art. He emerges from contemporary art training and practice. Um, but Wiley is also engaged with a larger cultural sphere, contributing to the ways that sphere produces a sense of presence. We saw his work featured in the TV soap opera Empire. We noticed him on the cover of a portraiture themed issue of Vanity Fair magazine wearing a suit of armor. And we've passed through chambers full of 43 grim faced men in Washington DC's National Portrait Gallery to reach his painting of President Barack Obama. Wiley's work circulates widely and helps shape our shared image world. Uh, Wiley's approach can be appreciated on several levels. From the point of view of Black audiences, there can be some satisfaction taking and seeing Black figures treated nicely for once. From an institutional perspective, among museums and galleries and the media, politics of inclusion offer a framework for situating Wiley's work. A uh, liberal audience might relate to this as politically appropriate diversity. Placing a figure into a ground where he was previously prohibitive, prohibited is an integrative move. And in the realm beyond policy, watching this change in status offers a kind of drama, the frisson of a black figure centered in a place of prominence, holding that guise of certainty and posture of confidence, dominance even, that European portraiture had secured for the wealthy, the elite, and the protagonists of history. There's a perverse pleasure in relating one's body to this arrangement. Um, with a new painting that responds to Sir Thomas Gainsborough's Blue Boy, Wiley again revises a masterpiece, adding Black youth to the repertoire of English grand manor portraiture, redirecting the genre's aggrandizing powers and challenging its exclusivity. In an allusion to his own Los Angeles upbringing, where he was inspired by Blue Boy as a youth visiting the Huntington, Wiley proposes to place and has now Gainsborough's jaunty young chap from 1770 in direct dialogue with someone more like himself. Uh, apart from the possible ancestral Moorishness of Britain's Queen Charlotte, the figures of this type of portraiture are decidedly white. The grandness of their milieu is undergirded by the profit of colonization. There's a surround of England's world activities, including the transatlantic trade and enslaved Africans, then at its height, and more than a century of genocidal conquest in North America and violent public-private imperial expansion in South Asia. Not only did these campaigns and adventures enrich the empire through the appropriation of territory, resources, and bodies, but expanded a peripheral vision that buttressed the look of Britishness. Curiously, Blue Boy stands slightly apart from others in his painting tradition, revealing some of the precarity of this position. Neither politician nor aristocrat, the blue boy poses playfully askew in an unstable field, his attire delicate and superfluous, his unfulfilled masculinity marked by the youth of his face and unwigged hair, his very identity unconfirmed. He is the symbol of an ideal of potential. Um, I cite costume historian Kimberly Chrisman Campbell, who writes for the catalog as well, to talk about the kind of pastiche and melange and combination that already exists in the way attire and uh, apparel and uh, uh, the scenery uh, appear in the Grand Manor portraiture. And uh, I say this consideration of the Grand Manor opens up ways of looking at Wiley's work beyond the simple establishment of affirmative representations. These paintings, like much of the European canon, are full of allusion and recombination muddled by persistent attempts to attach their present to class classical Mediterranean history, relying on a set of costumes and a dramatic mood that reference theatrical action. In this sense, Wiley's strategy of juxtaposition 
relying on postmodern appropriation is not a radical reversal of the order, but rather a fulfillment of its own logic. There is no centered and unified original against which to agitate. All representations are contingent in the first place, Wiley's no less. Rather than simply resolving paintings powerful tensions and positive images of black people, Wiley's work casts black figures deeper into the morass that the Grand Manor plays in, reminding us that history is an illusion, power is up for grabs, what disappears is as consequential as what appears, race is arbitrated, gender is a travesty, and size matters. I'm attracted to the term overrepresentation, which the philosopher Sylvia Winter has used to describe the ways European thought has wrapped itself up in speciation, aligning whiteness with the category of human, and extending that scientism through the projects of sovereignty and conquest that constituted the West. The protagonist of history appears as the human and as white. All humans are he and he is everywhere, both the center of space, holding the core of the body politic in place, and the radical agent of its exteriority, the explorer extending the territory of enclosure and allotment. This overrepresentation articulates a descriptive statement of man and ensures that the disciplines that produce knowledge itself re reiterate that statement. Winter and many theorists and scholars since, who I've had the privilege to study as a performance studies scholar, uh, have shown that the racial construction is not an outgrowth of Western thought or a feature appearing at the edges of its far-flung colonial activity, but a central support upon which its economic, juridical, and aesthetic matrix rests. Uh, among these scholars, um, and this is now departing from my essay, is uh, Dr. Simon Gikandi, also joining us today, whose brilliant study, Slavery and the Culture of Taste, shows that, quote, both the institution of slavery and the culture of taste were fundamental in the shaping of modern identity, and that they did so not apart but as non-identical twins, similar yet different. In this dialectic of identity and difference, slavery and taste came to be intimately connected even when they were structurally construed to be radically opposite. And I'll just add that the first cultural site I entered after my long COVID quarantine was the Grand Manor Painting Gallery for a meeting with Melinda and other staff members. And after that isolation and the world changing events and the political shifts of 2020, I had somehow imagined that we could start over from scratch. <laughs> and I was therefore daunted by the spectacular power of those humongous gold frames, those imposing figures and all of the arrangements of power and history they signal. These works continue to shape Euro-American Euro understandings of subjectivity, objecthood, and value. The Huntington's collection, of which these paintings are crown gems, begins with the priorities of its founders, Henry and Arabella Huntington. But as I discovered researching the museum, its holdings travel from there down many interesting routes. Beyond the Grand Manor, the collection includes inspiring works such as Sergeant Claude Johnson's gorgeous blue-green ceramic Head of a Boy, circa 1928. Johnson said of his own work, quote, it is the pure Negro, I am the pure American Negro I am concerned with, aiming to show the natural beauty and dignity in that characteristic lip and that characteristic hair, bearing and manner. And I wish to show that beauty not so much to the white man as to the Negro himself. The Huntington's collection also includes a late 19th century bust of Robert E. Lee, about which, about which much else could be said. Somewhere among these, we see Wiley's rearticulation, and I'm reminded that my own interest in exploring, resisting, reenacting, and testing the boundaries of a Western representational apparatus is itself a queer interest. Uh, in an essay on an unrelated topic, uh, our panelist, Dr. Joseph M. Pierce, has described queer as a relational possibility. Uh, the quote, the queerness of our stories is found in the very act of telling them, as well as in their silences, ruptures and refusals. The queerness that I am describing is reflected in the settler imaginaries of self, in the search for new forms of narration that challenge contemporary understandings of authenticity, and in the willingness to challenge normative demands for identitarian legibility. So from there, I wanna launch us into our day. Um, we've brought uh, together scholars from different areas who approach the question of what it is to appear <laughs> in very different ways. 
And we've asked this question uh, through three kinds of categories. The opening panel starting six minutes ago uh, is called Modernity's Genres. And I've asked, I said, uh, let's open up the big philosophical picture at what's at stake in depicting humans using Modernity's Genres. Um, later at 1045, we'll be joined by uh, esteemed art historians who will discuss humans and other depictions in 18th century art. And finally, at 1230, we'll be joined by art historians and scholars and curators. We'll be discussing undoing representation in contemporary art, speaking about work from the 20th and 21st centuries. So let me uh, quickly introduce our panelists in this first section. Uh, Simon Gikandi is Robert Shermer Professor and Chair of English at Princeton University where he is also affiliated with the Departments of Comparative Literature and African American Studies and the Program in African Studies. Among his many publications, the book Slavery and the Culture of Taste was winner of awards from the Modern Language Association, the African Studies Association, and Choice. Um, our second speaker will be Zakia Iman Jackson, who is Associate Professor of English at the University of Southern California. She is the author of numerous journal articles and the book Becoming Human Matter and Meaning in an Anti-Black World. Jackson is currently working on a book project tentatively titled Obscure Light, Blackness and the Derangement of Sex Gender. And finally, our third panelist this morning will be Joseph M. Pierce, who is Associate Professor of Hispanic Languages and Literature at Stony Brook University. He is the author of Argentine Intimacies, Queer Kinship in an Age of Splendor, and many articles and essays, and is the co-editor of the GLQ issue, Queer Americas, Translation, Decoloniality, and the Incommensurable. Pierce is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Um, we're going to, time permitting, do some conversation at the end of each panel. And we first wanted to open it up to panelists from other panels um, to see if you have any comments or questions to share. And then time permitting, we'll turn to the Q&A function that uh, Steve mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so thank you so much. And I'd love to turn it over to Dr. Gikandi. My presentation is called Inside and Outside Genre on Portraiture and Black Subjectivity. I would like to thank Malik Gaines and the team at the Huntington Library for this invitation to reflect on the portrait and its relationship to people who have often, often been considered non-persons in the modern age. I start with Frederick Douglass's famous commentary on a troubled relation between white artists and black persons, because it continues to haunt debates about the politics of representation in situations of dominations. Douglass's major claim was that it, Negroes can never have impartial portraits at the hands of white artists. It seems to us next to impossible for white men to take likeness of black men without most grossly exaggerating their distinctive features. The portrait, like other forms intended to represent personhood, was from the very beginning a genre of power and domination. This claim might initially appear strange to us because the portrait now seems to be far removed from the scenes of enslavement and colonial violence that we often see in illustrations daguerreotypes or even photography. As part of the American family lawmans, the portrait has not been kind to the black body. Even when it's deployed in situations of extreme violence, the portrait is associated with refinement and exclusiveness. It's the prime example of what has come to be known as an aesthetic ideology, one that transforms the scenes of a cruel modernity into a picture that transcends the harsh materiality of social life. In this situation, the portrait is caught in a dialectic of what Karl Marx once called freedom and necessity. In this presentation, I start with the premise that artists, even the most radical ones, need to work within generic conventions in order for their works to be recognized as belonging to a particular tradition. In other words, even when their works push against established conventions, artists have to position their art in a certain relationship to genre and the rules and regulations associated with it. 
The Obama portraits are perhaps some of the most radical paintings at the National Gallery in Washington, but their radicalness only becomes apparent when they are located within a tradition of American portraiture over a period of 300 years from George Washington to the present. It's only when they are put in relation to the generic conventions that have driven American portraiture that these portraits become radical. I, in short, we cannot think about portraiture except with the, within the prison house of its generic conventions and the logic it assumes. Genre demands that the work of art make sense or acquire value within a canon and within set rules about the production and circulation of the artwork. But at the same time, we should not see the rule of genre as setting an absolute, absolute limit because as the philosopher Jack Derrida has noted, transgressions and subversions can take place within the limits that the genre establishes. The question of course is what is involved when we speak about genre? And this question I think is a question of what are we to do with tradition? In situations of domination, the subject and artist's relation to tradition is complicated by the asymmetrical relationship between the demands of the aesthetic as the site of freedom and the form of mastery or power that necessitates the portrait and makes it the favorite genre of the powerful. Moreover, the context in which painting takes place, one defined by bonded labor and racial violence means that neither personhood nor its representation on the canvas can be taken for granted. Portraiture seems to function as a genre in which the freedom of certain subjects is affirmed at the expense of others. It's a mode of representation that claims fidelity as its measure of success, yes, yet it's always achieved in states of unfreedom. In American portraiture in particular, in a so-called grand manner, the representation of the master, indeed the projection of mastery through a portrait is often achieved at the expense of diminished, sometimes depersonalized black figures on the margins of the portrait. And of course, one of the most famous American examples of this is John Trumbo's John George Washington with his slave William Lee in the portrait, but at the same time blurred, almost diminished. The figure that's on the margins diminished informs and haunts the idea of the person, yet this figure is not recognized as a person uh, who is worthy of refraction and hence of seeing. So what do we do when we see or look at a portrait in which white selfhood is projected in relation to the subjected. What do we see when we look at the figure of the enslaved or colonized, both inside and outside the canvas? I say inside and outside the canvas because as we can see in this example, uh, William Lee is in a frame and performs an important function. I'll come back to that in a moment, but at the same time, is almost outside the frame. So it's this inside outside relationship that I'm interested in. Conceived as a genre that would represent the likeness of elite figures and powerful men during the Renaissance and after, the portrait was from the very beginning connected to the ideal of the gentleman or the aristocrat. It was intended to represent powerful people within what Woodhall has called institutions of power and prestige. And so if the portrait seems to be the most privileged genre in the Western tradition, or at least one of the most privileged genres, it's because it was conceived as a space for displaying both the achievement of the individual and their nation in each mirroring each other in uncanny ways. In slavery and coloniality, displaying the presence of the other was the sign of power itself. Located in the margins, the enslaved came to embody the new evaluation and elevation of the subject of the portrait, its will to power and mastery. Uh, we see 
this in many American paintings. Uh, the example I have here is Charles Calvert and the slave. And this is going to be repeated quite often. Um, it is by having the slave on the margin that the selfhood of the master and what I would call the will to mastery is displayed. It is significant that in these paintings, the slave cannot be represented in the portrait except as a subjunctive to the master who owns him or her. And presented in this subject, subjunctiveness, the black figure on the margins enables not only the fantasy of white power, of mastery as it were, but also enables the representation of a specific American ethos. In fact, I would argue that it's when the slave is incorporated into the American painting that American painting comes to portraiture, comes to acquire its distinctive identity. And that's how it can actually be uh, separated from the European tradition that had influenced it. Still, a decolonial reading or viewing de demands that we refuse to read the portrait or the picture in the terms that it has established. And we need to have the will to see through uh, the, the, the terms and the presuppositions of the painting, painting itself, because it's only when we refuse to read the painting in the terms it has established that we come to have a different understanding of the world of bonded labor and coloniality that informed it in the first place. The example I have used quite often is just as Cohn's uh, portrait of Henry Dawar. And um, one of the things I would like to note is the way in how in Kuhn's painting, the boy on the margins is presented as a person, but he also contains the reminder that he's not free. The cora around his neck does not leave this in doubt. In fact, if we were to think about this figure in relation to the lived experience, uh, there is a sense in which uh, we would see uh, see beyond the golden robe of Danal and the, uh, the, the gaze that the portrait inv inv invites from us, because there is a way in which looking at the picture from the margins uh, reminds us that, of course, Danal, the subject of this portrait, is going to be a slave owner. He is going to be a person of power. And that's why I'm saying that the portrait becomes, as it were, the expression of a certain kind of will to mastery. But the question I want to pose here today, is there a way we can read these portraits except in the terms they have presented themselves? Is there a way we can start to look at them from the margins as it were? What indeed does it mean to look at a person in decoloniality? I think that looking at the portrait in decoloniality is first and foremost, the development of a way of seeing that recognizes the figure in the margins as a constitutive element of the portrait rather than mere background. To borrow a term from Zravo Zizek, the dark figures on the margins short circuit the dominant idea of the portrait as a genre. The work of the dark figures on the margins is to disturb what the portrait conceals or disavows. And I think these marginal figures uh, disturb the portrait and expose its presuppositions in a number of ways. The first and most obvious way in which the figure in the margin disturbs the reading or the viewing of the portrait is that they signal the subject's connection to the world of slavery and colonialism, the world that's disavowed. The world that the portrait would like to disavow is the one that is expressed and represented on the margins and indeed invites us to recontextualize the painting. The example I have here is the, is the portrait of Jan Praga, director general of the Dutch West Indian Company at Elmina in Ghana, painted by the Dutch painter Francis Damien in 14, uh, 1742. And the caption I have there actually is from uh, the museum in Amsterdam. In looking at this picture, we can see how the painter wants to ensure that our focus is on the governor Pranger himself, the central figure in the portrait. We can tell his social standing from the velvet coat he wears and the intricate monograph on the tablecloth 
as governor of Cape Coast, uh, Elamina Castle, there's a way in which uh, um, Pranga starts at the very top of the Dash West Indian Company. But notice how the two insignias of this power, the source of his power, the slave and the castle, are put on the margins of the portrait and are slightly blurred so that they are not visible. They are visible, but not enough to shift perspective away from the self that is the subject of the portrait. Uh, and here you can see, of course, the castle slave holding a palace. And uh, if you look closer right here, the uh, castle at Almina is contained in a mirror or is reflected in a mirror. I want to suggest that it's these two figures, the castle in the mirror and the uh, slave on the margins that actually recontextualizes this picture and draws attention to the world that the portrait would like to disavow. The same scene can um, be detected if you look at another painting, which is um, Daniel Vatangen's portrait of Jan Wackenberg, governor at Elmina, this painting from 1660. Here again, the painter wants the viewer to focus on Wackenberg, the quintessential self-made subject who has risen through the ranks of the Dutch West Indian Company. It's through the portrait that the master of the slave trade comes to be recognized as a member of the ruling class. And yet it is at the margins that we see a larger story and begin to detect a thicker description. I'm referring here, of course, to the representation again of a castle slave on the margins of this portrait, visible but not too visible, and the castle at Elmina at the edge of the picture uh, right here. Uh, the margins tell us an interesting story. They tell us that the slave dungeon at Elmina is central to Wackenberg's self-fashioning as a man of power, and that his selfhood is built on the slave trade. The enslaved African signifies the wealth that enables the Dutch golden age. So the master, as we've learned from Hegel, has no identity except in relation to the slave. But the most important point I would like to make in both these two paintings is again, the significance of that which appears to be invisible in recontextualizing uh, the picture, uh, the portrait itself. And indeed it can help us disavow and uh, expose as it were the world that's being negated or relegated to the margins so that the man of power can be projected uh, in his refinement. I want to conclude by noting that a decolonial engagement with a portrait, which demands that we make the figures on the, mar on the margins or read the center of the portrait in relation to the things that it contains or confines to the margins is not an easy task. It's not an easy task, obviously, because the portrait like all genres wants us to read it according to the intentions or the desires of the master or the person who commissioned the portrait. And yet I want to suggest that we have to be involved in a gesture of refusal. We have to refuse to read the picture in the terms that the painter has represented it. It is this kind of reading that the genre does not encourage, but it's the kind of reading that demands a transformation of the habits of viewing and reading that we have become habitual to. For us, for how can we break the laws of genre while working within the same laws? Such a move of reading, a mode of reading or viewing demands that we see through the portrait to get to the things that it wants to blur, the things that help us understand the truth of the picture as it were. And I've been thinking about this, especially in relation to Kahinde, Kahinde Wiley's work, the way in a sense, he comes to put some kind of value on the margins of the picture. And that is what invites us to think beyond the portrait as the representation of the person. The flowers on Kehendi Wiley's portrait of Barack Obama takes us far away from the White House or the National Portrait Gallery and point to, to another world, the world that made Barack Obama. The chrysanthemum moms of Chicago, the jasmine of Hawaii, and the African blue lilies of, uh, of Kenya or East Africa, 
uh, become as important in the portrait as the person himself. Uh, similarly, uh, Amy Sherrod's portrait of Michelle Obama turns the former first lady in what the artist calls something bigger, more symbolic, an archetype. And I think what makes her an archetype is precisely not the dress itself, but how the dress gestures to a tradition, a traditional, uh, in this case, a tradition of quilting uh, along uh, African-American tradition. So that when we look at Michelle Obama, basically we have to look beyond the person and see what the context invites us to reflect on as part of what has come to be known as a thick description. But as I noted at the opening of this lecture, the radicalness of these paintings is to be found in their simultaneous, the artist's simultaneous acknowledgement and destruction of tradition. In fact, I would say that as we reflect on the works of Kehendi Wiley, what we should be thinking about is the way he always begins by gesturing to a tradition, in this case, Thomas Gainsborough's Blue Boy. And yet at the same time, he destroys that tradition by populating it with the things that invite us to look at the portrait otherwise. Uh, in this uh, particular new painting, what struck me as I was looking at it this morning was not, not only the play with colors, which is part of a sign signature style, not only the attitude of this figure, uh, but also uh, I was struck uh, by the batik, uh, the, the tie and dye shirt that he's wearing. And that's why I had to put one of mine today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'd like to uh, invite Zakia Jackson to present. Thank you so much, Malik, Steve, everyone at the Huntington who has made this possible, um, and my co-panelists, Professor Gikandi and Professor Pierce. Jo Joy Bolemwini, Bolem Joy Bolemwini, and Timnit Gabru's analysis of computer vision is instructive for gleaning how the politics of sex difference and gender inform the anti-Blackness of visual technology and culture. They demonstrate that while Shirley cards are rarely used in the era of digital photography, darker skin continues to confound in ways that reveal that recent photographic technology is also not value-free and that computer vision is biased against darker hued females and trans people in particular. Employed in high stakes sectors such as law enforcement and healthcare, automated facial image analysis is used for tasks including facial detection, classification and recognition that are built into most social media platforms, internet search engines and smartphones. Bolem Winnie and Gabru found that these mechanisms perform with lowest accuracy on darker females and completely fail to register the diversity of trans realities of sex and gender, extending the racial and gendered logics of comparative anatomy and eugenics. Its reading of the surface, hue, and facial geometries prove shallow, as the look of sex and gender are already racially prescribed and proscribed. Thus, such facial recognition software trained with biased data misgenders, misgenders darker skinned females and trans people via what is so often assumed to be socially neutral, the algorithm. I want to pause here to tarry with the difficulty of conceptualizing accuracy in this context. If accuracy is defined by the completion of surface effect with truth, then in fact, there is a gross error and that this notion of accuracy rests on what a surface comes to mean via its metaphysical mystification, not its endogenous essence. From this perspective, one could very well argue that Bolem Winnie and Gabru's findings do excavate a latent truth. The social inscription of sex gender is fundamentally a racially misogynist logic that constructs Black femaleness as apparatus, 
an indeterminacy that does not yield resolution in the face of purported visual evidence of sex. Imperceptibility sets limits on all perceptual frames. Thus, one cannot collapse image matter with either materiality or being. The spectacle of realness swallows transness up. It substantiates, it substantiates via transphobia's racially misogynistic underpinnings. As Eva Hayward succinctly states, observing the implications of trans feminine artist Erica Rutherford's paintings, quote, photography is a naive technology for representing transsexuality, end quote, because the referentiality of transsexuality cannot be imagistically realized. Photographic logics, or what she calls the photoontic, suggests that photography captures the real and presupposes the photo self as sex. But this is a logic that can never capture or represent innermost knowledge and bodily sense. The materiality of embodiment, the body as feeling, sensation, and process of concatenation exceeds photographic representationalism and the sensual body eludes photographic capture. Eliza Steinbach's groundbreaking shimmering images, trans cinema, embodiment, and the aesthetics of change, in speaking to the pressures of a gender sex system that seeks to make public the so called truth of a trans person's sex and gendered body via a transphobic common sense, follows Mika Ball when Steinbach argues that visuality itself should be in the position of being the primary object of study, such that visual studies should not presume, quote, it already knows what is visual and what is not, forgetting the profoundly impure act of looking, rife with interpretive framing, complexly mixed media, soliciting synesthetic sense perceptions, and bursting with affect, end quote. At the core of my work has been the claim that anti-Blackness's affects and epistemological conditions have fundamentally organized the optical common sense and modern grammar of sex gender. The clinical demand that the proper performance of sexuality be defined by using Steinbach's term, quote, compulsory adherence, to white gender norms, end quote, must be understood as a translation of racial science, racial reproductive science, the fungibility of the slave as commodity, and what I term ontologized plasticization, a racially sexuating semi-material entangling that affect what Spiller terms the flesh and has and have since become synonymous with notions of the void black hole and abyss in black feminist theory, black feminist queer theory. After all, compulsory white gender norms are not simply one set of norms among the parallel array of racially demarcated gender norms, but have and continue to be a racially ontologizing effect of relational hierarchies that accompany the ongoing paths of conquest, enslavement, and imperial expansionism. As Fortune Spillers instructs, anti-Black gendering and ungendering in all of its paradoxes is an essential determinant of how gender, whiteness, norms, and certainly white gender norms have come to be represented, known, felt, perceived, disciplined, and regulated. In other words, the exterioceptive ego and proprioceptive ego of whiteness are no less formed by the theater of race than that of Black folk. Like Steinbach's shimmering images, my work seeks to challenge the scientism of observation that expunges the power of the unmarked, unspoken, and unseen. Rather than presume that to see is to know or that the seen self corresponds with the sentient self, I am interested in the historical perceptual and epistemological conditions that make a reflected self 
appear transparent and foster attempts to master opacity and fluctuations in the visual field, which Steinbach terms shimmer. Shimmering, they maintain, suspends epistemological disbelief. If represented as occupying a space marked by sex, gender, and that's a big if, darkness and blackness are often sexed as female, are perceived as symbolic of the maternal by a wide range of artists. For example, Wangechi Mutu describes black in the following way, quote, black is the first and very last color of consciousness. Any nascent memory or experience we might have of floating around in our mother's insides organs hardly existent. Eyes, ears, sensory organs minimally developed. It's black and deep purple and murky dark black, dark, dark blues that are a backdrop to origination and our first recognition of existence. Blackness surrounds our planet and our universe more than any other color, end quote. In a very different context, a roundtable on the topic of Blackness in 1967 that included artists Otto Tambellini and Michael Snow, musician Cecil Taylor, architect Harvey Cohen, sociologist Arnold Rockman, and influential modernist Ad Reinhardt. Reinhardt readily evoked conflations of Blackness with the maternal, perhaps belying his claim that his own monochromatic black paintings were a respite from the demands of narrative and figuration, as well as what he terms simple. So in other words, he said they were art for art's sake. Quote, I suppose it began with the Bible in which black is usually evil and sinful and feminine. There is a relation in Christianity to the black hell void and the heaven white heaven myth. The blackness of darkness that is involved with formlessness or the unformed or the maternal, the hidden guilt, origin, redemption, faith, truth, time, end quote. The troping of blackness occurs in terms that inform the racial logics of sexual differences, whereby blackness is occupied by an imagined space bound up with formlessness. The tethering of Black maternal corporeality rather than embodiment and formlessness shapes the perception of the Black female sex as simultaneously indeterminate and divergent in relation to categorical forms such as sex and gender, while negating and even nullifying assignations of Blackness abound, what requires sustained investigation is the gendered and sexuating force of compounding anti-Black assignations. The way that femaleness, maternity, and feminine gender expressions marked by Blackness have been made to bear the burden of Blackness's nullification and are instrumentalized in the anxious arrangement of representation and value, including but exceeding extending far beyond the terms of sexual differences. The idea of origin is commonly conflated with the maternal body, in particular, the black and the maternal body, in a way that problematically figures the origin of existence, of life, of racial blackness, even though in fact, sexual reproduction is neither the origin of life nor the origin of the species we call human. Such narratives and figurations obscure three billion years of living organism activity involving microbial life and non-sexual reproduction in the Archean and Protozoic eons. As Myra Heard notes, quote, during most of our evolutionary heritage, our ancestors reproduced without sex. And most of the reproduction that we undertake in our lifetimes has nothing to do with sex, end quote. Organisms in four out of five kingdoms reproduce without the requirement of sex, and some species of fungi have sexes that number in the tens of thousands, not to mention the many species that change sex or are intersex. The presumptions of dimorphic sex polarity and the primacy of sexual reproduction has left most of the current reproductive activity of the human species obscured and under research, which affects a double privileging of organisms as autonomous individuals 
and of sexual reproduction. To put it plainly, what I'm suggesting is that what seems like the most natural starting point, the scene and means of birth, is neither natural nor the starting point. Nature, or rather biology itself, unsettles the mythopoetics of Genesis, its heteronormativity, its essentialized notions of sex difference, and its sanctification of the individual, and by extension, troubles what Sylvia Winter calls, quote, the substitute religion, in quote, of neo-Darwinism and its theodicy, survival of the fittest. What if we replace the ideals of a stable, knowable origin with the flow of infinite regression and the primacy of the individual with profusive differentiation? What might that dislodge in our racialized imaginations of both sexual differences and the mythopoetics of maternity? What might it open up? At the same time, how might an acknowledgement of more lived ontic embodiments and mutability escape the capture of the codes and operations of racial hierarchies that equally and readily adapt to sex gender binarism and pluralism, given that anti-Blackness subtends both configurations. It is by working through these challenges together that it may become possible to discern Blackness's latent transfiguring potentialities. And how, might, and how we might make sex gender indeterminacy work in the interests of the nullified. Might such a praxis expose ontologies of sex gender to a sublime derangement? When discussing Faith Ringgold's fascination with how an artist represents themselves, next slide. Feminist critic, Michelle Wallace, Ringgold's daughter, ponders Ringgold's exploration of the classic genre of the artist self-portrait. Will you move to the next slide, please? Curiously, thanks. In an example she discusses, the artist and his model, Ringgold is seemingly absent. Per Wallace, quote, the artist portrayed is a black male and his black model, and his model is a white female. Moreover, the actual artist who has composed the composition is not male at all, but a black female. It is interesting to think of this painting as an uncanny self-portrait in disguise, end quote. Ringel's painting might be commenting on the assumption that an artist, an artist is male or masculine, potentially black in the circles she traveled in, but not a black female. Its suggestion that the Western model of aesthetic beauty is typically imagined as a white female is hardly surprising. Recall here, photography surely called. Wallace wonders, quote, but where is face perspective? neither white nor masculine in this picture, even as a teenager, that question fascinated me, unquote. If we consider the prevalence of completions of blackness with femaleness, maternity, femininity, and the yet to be gender differentiated, perhaps Faith's perspective is not absent, but rather perceptible in the ground of the painting. The blackness through, through and against which the two figures appear. A dense darkness marked by recession, not lack or absence, where blackness abuts and provides contour and dimension to their respective forms. The painting does not simply frustrate representationalist expectations that the artist be mimetically represented, but rather refracts such conventions by revealing the anti-Black sex and gender terms of the given idea or ideals of both the artists and the appropriate subjects of exaltation. At the same time, it exposes that the operations of representationalist visibility are predicated on the limiting terms of anti-Blackness, which is to say the racialization of sexuation itself. The artist and his model provides a pondering of what is below the radar a scope of scopophilic objectification, its pleasures and, identi and its identifications. That which is illegible 
to the positive values of gender and sexuation, while nevertheless providing those values their negative space. How are the limitations of the given order of sexual difference and economies of desire built into and dictated by the materiality of the visual arts, not just by its representations? And how might we transvalue what is deemed mere excess, despite the anxiety aroused in the face of it? The interrelations of embodied life history and semiotics cannot be transparently read on a face or a body. Biography and character are not visualizable, but they nevertheless compose our embodiment and existence. Ringgold's use of figuration against the mandate of representationalist verisimilitude approaches the uncanny. She severs the all too easy equation of figuration and representationalism, an equation often hoisted onto the minoritized. Transparency in the mode of self-figuration and self-narrative is commonly deemed the only appropriate subject for such an artist. Figuration and the mode of her black light and the artist and his model is not representation, but rather a style of critique of the suffocating terms of figure, ground, subject, object, sexual difference, and representationalist transparency. Thank you. Oh, last, oh, I forgot. I was gonna go to the last slide, but no worries, I forgot. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. And uh, let's turn to uh, Professor Joseph Pierce. And Joseph, don't worry, we can go into the break a little bit if you. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think I've got this um, okay. pretty well timed, but we'll see. Great. All right. So thank you, thank you for this um, opportunity. Um, I, I, I hadn't ever looked very much at the archives um, at the Huntington. And so this um, invitation allowed me to, to open up some new ideas um, to sort of dig through different archives. Um, and what I thought I was originally going to present took something of a, a turn. So rather than photography, I'm going to be looking at some paintings of Geronimo. Geronimo faces the viewer wearing a luminous red blanket. The arresting swath of color lingers in the eye, a saturated counterpoint to broad strokes of gray on a background, and the details of the sitter's deeply wrinkled face. Completed in 1897 at Fort Sill, Indian Territory, it was the first portrait done by Eldridge Ayer Burbank of a series commissioned by his uncle, Edward Everett Ayer, then the director of Chicago's Field Museum. Geronimo was a prisoner at Fort Sill. After decades of resistance, Geronimo surrendered to the US government along with about 30 Chiricahua Apaches in 1866. The army first sent them to Fort Marion, Florida, where they remained for about a year. This group of Chiricahua Apaches were then transferred to Fort Sill in the southeast of Indian Territory, which is where Burbank, as he put it, quote, journeyed in search of Geronimo on what was to be the first of 20 years of hunting the real Americans for my canvas, end quote. The realness of the Indian is what I am interested in exploring here. This realness must be hunted in Burbank's infelicitous recognition of the desire to capture a likeness that was only ever real from the vantage point of a white man with a gun, canvas, or camera. Indian realness is an illusion, or as Gerald Visenor argues, quote, the Indian is the simulation of ethnographic portraiture, end quote. The search for Indian realness is a quintessentially colonial enterprise, one that instantiates the mythologies and simulations that envelop indigenous presence in a willful and ongoing negation of the fact that Indian representation is only possible through absence. 
an absence that is achieved through the capture of a body that is not yet Indian, but which becomes one when wrapped in red skin or perhaps a red blanket. There are three strands of Native American history that intersect through this encounter at Fort Sill. First, Geronimo's surrender supposedly marks the end of the Plains Indian Wars. The settler colonial state could begin to imagine itself as having conquered the Indians west of the Mississippi and thus fulfilling its manifest destiny. Second, indigenous imprisonment opens a new chapter in US educational policy. Let us not forget that in 1875, Richard Henry Pratt was charged with transporting 72 indigenous prisoners from Fort Sill to Fort Marion, Florida, where he then undertook his first experiment in indigenous education, kill the Indian, save the man. Pratt's experience at Fort Marion informed his later work as superintendent of Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, which was officially opened on November 1st, 1879. We move from the demand for extermination, a rather expensive military enterprise, to the promise of a supposedly more humane and cheaper solution to the Indian problem assimilation through education. Third, the representation of indigenous peoples now supposedly domesticated began to shift from the mid-centuries romanticized noble savage, i.e. the novels of Fenimore Cooper um, and the paintings of George Caitlin to the ethnographic type, such as Burbank. If Geronimo's surrender marks the culmination of this shift from savage to ward, his portrait represents a similar turn in how Indians were imagined in the settler mind. The Indian becomes a visage on the horizon of disappearance. Burbank made seven portraits of Geronimo. In all but one, he is wearing a red blanket. But Geronimo was not the only subject portrayed in this way. Between 1897 and 1900, Burbank painted 23 portraits in which the sitter is wearing a brilliant solid red blanket. These sitters come from nine different indigenous nations and the portraits were done at Fort Sill and Darlington, Oklahoma and across the Southwest at the San Carlos Apache Reservation, Zuni Pueblo among other locations. Why would so many of Burbank's indigenous portraits include this feature? What role does this red blanket play in the artist's work and in the lives of the subjects he painted? Um, my slide is a little sticky. There we go. Okay. My hypothesis, and I'm very proud of myself for having a hypothesis, but I, here is my hypothesis, um, is that the, the blanket was not actually red, but rather Burbank painted red what was likely a gray or blue government issued and industrially manufactured wool blanket. There are several reasons why I think the blanket was not actually red. One. It is highly unlikely that so many sitters from different communities over several years themselves produced or owned this same blanket or one of the same style. Blankets too. Blankets were the subject of intense negotiation between tribes and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which as a government agency preferred drab economy over expensive dyes. No government records I have read describe red blankets being provided to Indians. Three, by the early 20th century, industrial trade blankets like the Pendleton were already displacing traditional weavings, which in turn were sought after by white collectors. As an imitation of traditional indigenous textiles, the industrial trade blanket always included some supposedly native design feature or pattern. None are a singular solid color. And fourth, Burbank himself had an economic interest in both painting and collecting Indian textiles, as I will describe below. 
My sense is that it was likely an industrially produced prop rather than a native textile. The enterprise of trading native made objects must have been part of Burbank's uncle, Edward Ayer's reasoning for commissioning Burbank to paint indigenous people in the first place. Perhaps if the paintings did not sell, at least Burbank would be able to procure some native goods, which already had a market in Chicago. Burbank would write to his wife in 1897, I received two letters from Uncle Ed. This is Ayer, Uncle Ed. He wants me to send him eight blankets, $10, $15, and $25 each. Also wants me to send five or six pictures I have painted as a lady wants to pick out one for an Xmas present. A Christmas present and a corner on the blanket trade. The rise of Burbank's Indian paintings is already entwined with a growing market for indigenous crafts. In fact, his paintings helped consolidate that market, and I think it is safe to say, increased the demand and desirability of Indian blankets for white audiences and collectors alike. If this is the case, then the redness of Burbank's blanket was a stylistic choice um, that may or may not have been made with the approval of Geronimo or the other sitters. Burbank notes in his 1946 memoir that Geronimo constantly haggled over payment for his likeness. He does not, however, indicate exactly what Geronimo wore. If there was never an original red blanket, but rather a series of red becomings, then the red of the blanket exceeds the frame of the portrait. It is a floating signifier that migrates to other bodies, attaches to them and envelops them in the artist's visual matrix of false indigenous representation. Expanding on Bizonor's work noted above, I would like to propose that Geronimo's red blanket can be read not simply as a mimetic failure, but rather a fleshly conjuring of Indianness that both precedes the moment of pictorial capture and expands beyond it, lingering in the visual repertoire of colonial portraiture. The redness of the blanket is thus not simply a skin enveloping the man whose likeness is to be captured, but also an instantiation of the demand for redness as a shorthand for indigeneity itself. Redness shrouds Geronimo's body, unambiguously calling him both Indian and Spectre, the simulacrum of a, of a red man. Let us not forget that Indians were, not, were only known as red men from about the 1750s. Prior to that, colonial records primarily used terms like savage or heathen to indicate non-Christian and non-European origin, but at the same time, uh, colonial records describe indigenous peoples using various colors, such as tawny, the most common, olive, brown, and copper. The Indian was not always red, and his redness emerged out of a dialectic engagement across regimes of knowledge, power, and materiality. To put it another way, the goal of the artist is to make vibrant what is still, to represent, display, or exalt what is no longer there, or rather what was never there to begin with. The indigenous sitter for a settler portrait is not actually the subject of a representation. What once was an Apache becomes Indian on the canvas. This is only resemblance in that the erasure of indigenous presence is required for a residual indigeneity to stand in for a body that was never capable of bodying in the first place under these circumstances. To be honest, I do not know if there is a term for what I'm trying to describe. I'm still trying to figure this out. I mean that the painting of Geronimo is not a representation of him but something like an invention, simulation, or conjuring of the man onto the canvas. Geronimo becomes Indian by being painted as such. In this sense, he is not what is painted, but the image on the canvas is a citation of Geronimo without an original referent. Or perhaps there is an original referent, flesh beneath the robe, 
but that referent is unrepresentable on the canvas. It is imagined and viewed from the perspective of a settler ontology that has already foreclosed the possibility of indigenous materiality on its own terms. In fact, which requires the foreclosure of indigenous life for its own ont ontological legitimacy. Thus, the image is not what it seems, but rather a trace citation of a body that is not actually there. In the realm of painting, this may simply be painting. I may be describing a surrealist paradigm. Magritte might say, ceci n'est pas une indienne. Disney asked, what makes the red man red? Go. From Peter Pan and Andy Warhol continued the theme of Geronimo in one of his final series, Cowboys and Indians from 1986. Again, it is entirely possible that the blanket belonged to Geronimo and that he chose to wear it for Burbank. But what if we do not ask the question of why, sidestepping the issue of choice, and instead ask what the blanket itself is doing? What if the redness itself takes on a life of its own? What I mean is the mandate to represent the real upholds the disciplinary strategies of colonial, of the colonial imaginary, and yet the alternative, what could be a decolonial image system, is incommensurable with the field of recognition that would be required for such an alternative to make sense. Pictorial representation, or in this case, the drive toward mimetic fidelity is undone by the presence of a sitter who is native and yet can only be painted as Indian. An unfulfillable desire to see the canvas as representing the Indian that sits there before the artist. If representation is a field of desire rather than a material instantiation of presence, then we are left fundamentally with the question, not of reality, but speculation, not image, but gesture, not mimesis, but flesh. But there is no way to transform indigenous flesh into subject, which is to say, from a desired but abhorred object to a self with the ability to matter in this optical regime. What if the redness takes on a life of its own? The Huntington commissioned Burbank to make copies of his entire archive. For example, Red Woman. The description found in the digital collection um, I've quoted here uh, concludes with your next birthday present. Other um, images from the same archive note that this is one of 1,022 drawings by E.A. Burbank commissioned by the Huntington Library in 1922 to 1930. All of the drawings are copies of Native American portraits from the Newberry Library Collection, Chicago." End quote. More than a thousand drawings in red crayon on paper including a stamped note on the verso indicating the provenance of the original image, a copy in red crayon of a painting of an Indian that is itself a simulation. In conclusion, perhaps this is where the work of contemporary indigenous artists can help us respond to these questions. Take for example, Jeffrey Gibson's Sweet Bitter Love, an initiative of Toward Common Cause, which just closed at the Newberry Library um, and responds directly to Burbank's portraits. And I think this is similar, but technically distinct from, from Wiley's work and also that of uh, Kent Monkman to cite another contemporary example. Um, here, Jeffrey Gibson uh, completed six collages for the exhibition each was based on an archival pigment print of an original Burbank painting. In Gibson's treatment, the image is itself the object of study, thus rendering mimesis to the subject of inquiry. The failure of indigenous representation is not met with an alternative regime of knowing indigeneity, but rather by pointing out the incoherence of the demand for mimetic fidelity in the first place. One work, Christian Nietzsche, 
returns us to the redness as a paradigm of representation, but disrupted, painted over, enveloped again, but this time harnessing the eyes to respond, gazing back at the observer from five different angles. A pin at the center of a radiating compass rose says, I'm entitled. Entitled to what though? to intervene here in the materiality of this object, to the pastiche, to futurity, perhaps to redness itself. Not mimesis as a stilted plane of colonial capture, but form as a liberatory gesture. Thank you. Wait, I'm still writing down my Mises as a stilted plane of colonial capture. All right, um, thank you so much. Uh, we of course are running out of time uh, here and we've gone into the break time, but I do wanna, I think it's important to just take a moment to see if the panelists want to pose any questions or responses to each other or also reaching out to the panelists from other sessions who are with us now, if there's anything you wanna to pose to each other, I think we could take a moment to do that and just have a short break. This is just a quick comment. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, the papers were absolutely fantastic. Um, and this is a quick comment for Professor Gikandi. I was wondering if you thought that it, um, the uh, Candy Wiley of, of Obama, um, if it was available to read it as being in conversation with um, West African studio portraiture. I was thinking of people like Malik Sidibe or Samuel Faso and like um, the use of Ankara as a backdrop or of a, of a kind of, of studio context where there's a, a fabric background of, 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 of a, a pattern garment. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that in relation to the Obama, but I was thinking about that in relation to the, this more recent, the, the blue boy portrait, because in that one, you can see quite clearly, it's framed as see if it's a photograph in that studio tradition. And the background quite clearly is the kind of background you'd see in a studio. And uh, I, I thought even the pose itself uh, of, of the black boy seems again to invoke that tradition. So my suspicion is he is aware of it and uh, it invites all sorts of interesting questions about also what's, what the portrait demands in terms of prior knowledge because in order for you to recognize that studio tradition, you have to be familiar with that studio tradition. Uh, but my own feeling is that the, the, the portrait succeed in putting the honors of producing meaning on the person viewing it. And it makes it very difficult for the viewer to, to do exactly what uh, Joseph was talking about, to, to recuperate a kind of realism in it. So, so, uh, which is interesting because of course the, the studio portrait actually does the same. It does push back against the realism of it because people have dressed up and come to the studio and then they step outside. They are no longer the same kinds of people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's absolutely. Um, any other intra-panel comments we wish to share? Yeah, I guess I had just uh, maybe two quick observations for um, Professor Gikandi and um, Pierce. I, you know, of course, like as an art historian, I can't help just share some visual, you know, additional visual analysis. Like I was just thinking with the Van der Meen portrait, it's so striking that the attendant on the left, sorry, I have playful cats here who <laughs> are trying to get in the way. Um, but, you know, the, the Van der Meen portrait, I was really struck that the, um, the uh, you know, the attendant on the right, in a way, parodies the pose of the, um, of the, you know, the governor general, like, and he almost, on the one hand, he kind of looks like he's almost horse-like, but that's what, you know, really accentuates the sort of edge of the coat of the director general. So I'm just thinking of your own work as well in terms of mimicry and play. And I think, you know, we should also not give too much power to these portraits because they're, you know, the portrait, even as a painting is a studio event. And there are recalcitrant bodies that are standing in front of the painter. And so similarly with, you know, Professor Pierce's talk, I was just really struck by, especially the first painting that you started with, 
that there's just such a way in which that that blanket really kind of heightens the sense of the body, the figure pushing back in space, like a body that retains itself and withholds itself as well. So as provocative, you know, I really enjoyed your provocation about, you know, the, the, the sort of posing at the sort of, you know, at the pointing of a gun. But I think there are ways in which this painting still sort of convey something of that withholding as well. So I just wanted to note that. I think that one one thing that I would like to um, analyze further are actually the positions of the arms underneath the blanket. That 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 they're not the same, um, and that even in different portraits of Geronimo, um, his arms are pos positioned slightly differently. And so there's something about the folds of the of the blankets as well as the positioning of the arms that um, I'm not quite sure what what to do with, but I, but I, I take the point of, you know, also there's a, there is a body under there and it's, and it's creating space underneath that, that shell, but, but for, for whom is that body or for whom is that gesture, right? There's a gesture underneath there um, that I think a decolonial reading would actually try to bring out to the center, right? Like, like that's something that's covered, um, or close to the body to bring it out uh, um, to view. Yeah, and I was going to say one, one of the things I, I find quite interesting in Joseph's paper, uh, and also uh, Zakia, two, two things. One, uh, the question of opacity, which Zakia was talking about, because there, there's a way in which we go to these images expecting transparency, but they confront us with this deep opacity. Uh, but the, the other part is the, the failure of my message itself, because the portraits in the grand manner want to stage persons of a particular class uh, and kind of allegory of selfhood. But I think uh, the emphasis on the artifact itself, the fakeness of it, uh, because by the, even the person sitting, even Obama sitting in front of Ken Wiley, uh, one is struck by the fact that he's so self-conscious that he's posing. Uh, so you don't go to that portrait looking for Obama, the same way that you don't go to the, 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 the portraits from Huntington looking for Geronimo, because the portrait itself is already actually looking at his eyes. Uh, you can already see that he understands this is a game that's being played. Of course, it's a game with very severe, uh, serious consequences, but still one, one sits for hours and one is posing. And the question then is, what are we, what are we when we look at the portrait, are we looking at a person? Or are we looking at that uh, site of play and mimicry uh, mentioned earlier? Mm. Absolutely. Um, I'm stunned by this panel. These were incredible papers. Um, and thank you so much for engaging here for a moment. I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, I'm just uh, left with uh, Joseph's closing idea of representation as a field of desire, uh, coming into this thinking about how does representation operate. And not only could that help us think about strategies of refusal or transgression in terms of an artist's approach or a viewer's counter reading <laughs> of an object, um, but that could also help us move into a space of uh, non-binaristic <laughs> sexuality with the, the kind of uh, uh, transfiguring potential of blackness that Zakia Jackson uh, asked us to think more deeply about through lived ontic embodiments and mutability. Um, of, or it could lead us toward the kind of colonizing, concretizing desires <laughs> that we see on the surface of many of these works that have come up. Um, so I'm always drawn to this kind of ambivalence and I think it's something to uh, reach into further. I appreciate so much these contributions. We're way over time. We're, we're veering into the 18th century's territory here. Um, so I imagine we should just take a couple minutes of a, a quick break. So and, I was going to suggest yeah, Malik, that in yeah. fact, we take 15 minutes because I think it's important to, for everybody to have a bit of a mm -hmm. chance to relax and take a comfort okay. break. So how about we start again at 11 a.m. PST? That's uh, 13 minutes from now. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.